Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Um, this is going to be my first video and on this channel I will be talking a lot about children and mothers, specifically a mother's connection to their child and dealing with children with certain disabilities or anxiety disorders. Um, growing up I was actually a child of an anxiety disorder called selective mutism which is um, one in which a child has... Well, you know what? We'll get into that later. For now, I'm just going to be telling you guys, I'm going to be giving you tips, tricks um, for a lot of mothers out there. I'm not a mother myself. You know, eventually I will be one day, but I have, you know, a lot of experience with children, you know, babysitting and family and... Um, I'm going to be doing a lot of story times. This is going to be the first story time about, you know, how I grew up and, you know, the therapists I saw and kids in school and how I was bullied and all this stuff. But yeah, so I'm going to be... I also have a blog channel, which I will link down below. Let's just get right into it. Back to selective mutism. So for those of you who don't know what it is, it is a childhood anxiety disorder in which the child has a literal phobia of speaking. They, in my case, I did not talk to anyone but my mom, my dad, and my two sisters. Um, so that was quite a challenge for my family. I mean, for me, but for, for also my family. I mean, when I went to any kind of family gathering, I didn't speak to my grandparents. I didn't speak to my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, anything. Up until the age I was like 13. But I think my mom first, my, my parents noticed um, that I was having issues by the time I was in preschool. So I was around four years old. Um, I wasn't really, I mean, I don't remember it, but I, from what my parents told me, I wasn't very interactive with the kids, and I wasn't really making any friends, and stuff like that. I obviously wasn't talking to other family members at the time, so they saw that as a red flag, I guess. Um, but my first memory was probably when I started kindergarten, so at this time I was five years old. And I still remember my mother taking me to see my first therapist. It was a, a really old guy. Um, his office was really small. I remember very like old books on the bookshelf. And I remember sitting down at his desk. It was like he had his big desk and then it was like a little small chair for me. And... Um, it was very strange. I don't have a lot of memory being there, but I do remember like weirdly like looking at like this book. It was like about a bear and like how we, I, I don't know. It was, I just remember like vivid images. I don't, I don't remember going to this guy a lot, um, but I do remember times where like my parents would come in and he would speak to my parents. And eventually my parents told my teacher and you know in kindergarten cater everything to like make sure the kids like didn't make fun of me or you know make sure they knew that I was a special case I guess it was very very difficult because now now that I I, I talk so much even my family is like oh my god like from where you were then to where you are now it's like you could be a completely different person you know, and I don't remember why I would never talk. I don't, I don't even remember having that fear. It was like, it was literally a past life. I don't know what I was scared of. You know, with anxiety disorders, you never know why that person, like some, even with someone with anxiety, like I, I can't, I mean, I have anxiety now. Everyone has a little bit of anxiety, but like you never know what triggers you, you know, why you have this anxiety. It's just this feeling that you have inside. It was very hard for me to communicate in school. Um, very hard for me to communicate 
with outside family members and share my feelings. So I kind of kept everything inside, which is probably really terrible. But that's why I had all of these therapists. Um, at the time, I don't really know if they were helping, but I think my parents thought they were doing their best. So that's really all that mattered. As long as you can give everything they have and supply all of the materials, I guess, out there, then they felt that this was adequate and this is what was necessary for me at the time. I do have a lot of memories from when I was younger. I think just because they were traumatic that I was in certain situations where I probably needed to speak, but I couldn't. I'm going to do like three different stories. Um, the first one, I remember sitting at these tables in kindergarten. We had like these large tables instead of individual desks. So it was like a couple of kids. And I remember it was, I think it was like snack time or something. And I really had to pee, like so bad, so bad. You know, you need to do like the potty dance and that was, that was already over with. It was far, far past that. And I did not ask my teacher if I could go to the bathroom. The bathroom was literally in the classroom. It was like a door attached to the classroom. We'd go in, have your individual stall and whatever. Did not ask to go to the bathroom, nothing. And then all of a sudden I remember like being beyond desperation and I just peed myself right on the floor. Yep. And my teacher came over, her name was Mrs. Horgan. Everyone, all the kids saw, it was just like a little puddle around my chair, a little yellow puddle around my chair. And all the kids were laughing and I was super embarrassed and it was not great. But Mrs. Horgan did tell all the students that it was just my apple juice that spilt. But thinking about that now, I probably had a really large stain on my pants. I don't remember what pants I was wearing, but I'm sure it did not look like it was just my apple juice that spilled. I don't even think I was drinking apple juice, to be honest, but yeah. So um, that was interesting. And just, just looking back in it now, it's like, that embarrassment of peeing myself in front of all my classmates, the fact that I thought that would have been worse than just going to my teacher and saying, look, I gotta go to the bathroom. So it's a little, mm, I don't know about that. But um, there were a couple times I did this like um, carpooling thing with two girls from my neighborhood. Um, like our parents, our moms would take turns like driving us from school, picking us up. Sometimes my mom forgot, but that's a whole different story. Um, so there were a couple times where I ran into some situations. For example, one time on our way to school, as I was getting in the car, I had my hand stuck in the door and it was one of those like minivans where you like, it like slides in and I don't know how I got my, my hand, but my hand was in the door the entire way to school. And then as, as we're like halfway there, one of the girls starts screaming, like mommy. And then <laughs> she tells her mom like, um, Bridget has her hand in the door and the mom starts like freaking out. And she told my mom and it was a whole thing, but like, that is like tremendous pain. Like having your hand stuck in a door, not to mention for like at least three to five minutes. Like that's a long time to have your hand in the door, you know, like, but again, I would have rather chosen that embarrassment, that pain than talking to the mom and saying, look, my hand's in the door. So it, there's a lot of situations in like that is very troubling for people to understand, you know, especially parents. Why is she, you know, going out of her way to like avoid this so much? What is going on in her head? It's very hard to understand what kids like that are thinking. Like, 
why why don't you talk and like I didn't tell anyone my feelings I don't remember sharing my fear about like to my therapist because I like obviously I had a fear of talking so how were people going to get me to talk to my therapist it's very like counterintuitive like you're afraid of speaking yet you have all these therapists which you're supposed to talk to so I had another therapist um, in elementary school who basically hung out with me we just played we played with dolls we I don't know I don't even remember what we talked about I don't think we even talked about anything it was probably just her talking at me um, she played with me at recess because I had no friends for like a while I mean I, th I did actually have one friend in first grade I do remember that and I eventually started talking to that person like when we became friends I don't know we shared this weird connection I had a bit of sense of humor and I think that's what kind of like connected us so when you have that connection that doesn't necessarily involve talking it's easier to eventually start talking which I think is Tip number one, try to form a connection with this individual that might not be a connection in which they are afraid of. Meaning, if I was so afraid of talking, I think it would be helpful from outside trying to help me form a connection in which didn't require me to talk at first so I could feel that closeness with that person without necessarily having to go out of my way and trigger that sense of fear, you know? So I think that also probably worked with my therapist, thinking about it, we shared the connection with playing, you know, we played with dolls, and I'm sure that eventually helped me open up. Um, with my friend, we shared our connection with the sense of humor, and that helped me open up because I'm like, oh, you're like me, you know? We, we like to do this. Why should I be afraid of talking to you? As I was growing up, I remember I was more open to talking just because I saw everyone else around me also not having problems. Just like kids in class who were maybe embarrassed by one thing. I'm like, oh, that wasn't so bad. I can't even talk because I'm embarrassed or I'm afraid. Like. They're doing these things, you know? So as you get more experience seeing other people, it kind of helps you be like, oh, okay, that's not so bad. Um, so I think the first time I spoke to a teacher was in third grade, that was my first memory, asking for a glue stick. Very important. I was an artiste, I needed my glue stick to finish this project. So I asked, Mrs. Bud, for a glue stick. And that was that. I was not afraid to talk to a teacher after that. I mean, mind you, I wasn't, you know, the class clown, or I wasn't, you know, the one who's always like, what about this, what about that, you know, nothing like that. But I was never afraid to ask something if I very much needed it. It took a long time to gather everything that I knew about the world for me to be okay with being myself fully and completely. I think what really helped me was just kind of being an observer and well I was an observer anyways because I wasn't talking so I had to kind of just sit I was much of a listener I still am I'm a very good listener people tell me that I guess I'm, I'm a good listener I think it was that observing that kind of helped me realize that it's okay to be myself. I, I see everyone around me being themselves, you know? I, I need to step out of my shell, and only I can do that. So I think my second tip would probably be have your child keep some sort of journal. And I think this, go this is helpful for any kind of um, anxiety disorder or other types of learning disabilities. I know even if that requires I mean, I know journaling requires writing. Some kids with other disabilities obviously maybe can't write, and that's okay. Drawing. Drawing is fine. As long as you have something that you are observing maybe, and you're taking those thoughts and you're jotting them down. You're taking it, and then you're reiterating it. 
and you're forming your own thoughts, your own observations. I think that is very helpful. This is what I see and this is what I can interpret and then, then I can go and do what I need to do. I don't really know if that made a whole bunch of sense, but you guys get the point. <laughs> but I think as I got to middle school, um, everything was like a completely different ball game. I mean, it's, it's, it's in every stage of life as you're growing up, it's like a whole new chapter. It's a whole new set of things to learn. But once I got into my comfort zone where I thought I could talk, it became easier and easier to grab this information, interpret it, and show myself to the world. I mean, I, I'm still learning every day. It's always, some, I guess it's something that'll always be inside me. I'll always know that that was my past life. Those are my past thoughts. And it's kind of something that I, I keep in the back of my head. But I think that's also a good thing to know where you were and where you are now. Just so this video doesn't get too long, I'm going to conclude it here, um, but stay tuned for my second episode or part two of the, um, of the story time. 